Hi, everyone. Welcome to the UCL Lunchtime Lecture. Is girls' education the answer to everything? Today, we will have three speakers, Jenny Parks, Elaine Antelhalter, and Leila Kadewal. Jenny Parks is Professor of Education in the Gender and International Development Center at the Institute of Education here at UCL. Elaine Antelhalter is Professor of Education and International Development here again at the Center of Education and International Development at the Institute of Education at UCL. And Laila Kadewal is lecturer in Education and International Development at the Center for Education and International Development. I will be your chair today. I am Marisol Tello Almela. I am a current student at the MA in Education, Gender and International Development here at IOE. I am very happy to be here with you. Before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. All the questions for our presenters today are going to make, be made through slido.com and the hashtag is girls education. If you have any questions, please make them through there. Um, we will start with the three presentations from each of our speakers, followed by a Q&A at the end. So please bear with us. And um, without further ado, we will start with uh, Elaine. Thanks for the um opportunity to participate in this um oh, we got yeah in this up uh, uh UCL lunchtime lecture and I I want to set the scene with posing the question about how we think about girls education as an area of policy and practice mm -hmm. if we go to the next slide there's a very striking um statement from Boris Johnson when he was prime minister, where he see portrays girls education really as having these magical properties, these properties that uh, girls education um, can do can solve any problem. It's the universal cure. It's the Swiss Army <laughs> knife, um, complete with Allen key and screwdriver. And it's going to so, uh, answer any problem that afflicts humanity. And what I counterpose this um, statement from uh, the former prime minister with are uh, some of the not very extensive amounts of money that have been pledged by the in international community for girls' education. So we have these to the this kind of. Uh, paradox that girls education is this magical property that will um, solve climate change, uh, the problems of slow economic growth, the problems of uh, disjointed citizenship, but that we're not prepared to support it um, very extensively. If we go to the next slide, it um, distills a range of books and reports I've been working on for the last 20, 30 years on the theme of how to think about girls' education in policy and practice. And, and a book I wrote in 2008 on gender schooling and global social justice um, gave three suggestions of the ways in which girls' education was being thought about. It was being thought about as a narrow, I, I argued then, a, as a kind of narrow intervention. So girls' education um, was a kind of key that would unlock all kinds of other processes, reduced population growth, um, uh, increased economic growth, better health. Or it could be thought about, girls' education could be thought about as a way to uh, change institutions. Or the arguments I seen I was kind of coming down on or engaged with in 2008 was that what was so important was to involve women's rights organizations and girls' rights activists in this interactive or transformative approach to using girls' education. If we come to the next slide, what it distills is my attempt 10, 15 years later after harsh experiences with epidemics, with um, uh, financial crashes, with uh, increasing levels of poverty and insecurity, um, of ways to think about girls' education. And the, what I'm going to distill for you in, the, in this talk is four streams that I think um, 
uh, are the uh, can characterize the way people talk about girls' education. And I've called them what works, what matters, what disorganizes, and what connects. So if we go to the next slide, which is about uh, what works, this is the main approach to girls' education, I think, by used by governments, used by large international NGOs, and used by UN organizations. And it's associated with the idea that girls' education will bring women into the girls and women into the modern economy, will um, enhance their learning outcomes, and that it becomes this sort of depoliticized answer to everything. It doesn't matter what the problem is, girls' education will be, if not the solution, a significant part of the solution. And the programs that have tried to operationalize this have tended to focus on, girl, on, on specific groups of girls, marginalized adolescents, or uh, girls, um, encouraging girls to play sport or in, in, engage with STEM subjects. It's a position that I've identified with thinking about gender as a noun. Gender is something that you can count and delineate without much political problem. And these, the policy positions that expressed what works were evident in MDG3 and in the recent G7 declaration on girls' education. On, on the next slide is the more complex position of what matters. And this argument about what matters has been, um, ident has been sketched by many critics of what works, and I guess I would I would count myself as one of them. And it's associated with um, a position that says um, girls' education is not the answer to everything. Bigger ideas, human rights, gender equality, um, feminism are much more powerful kinds of answers. And in this position, girls' education is linked with a wider range of uh, of political concerns, um, human rights, feminisms, gender equality, gender justice, decoloniality. Uh, in the position uh, and amongst people who argue for what matters, the issue of gender is constantly linked with an issue of unequal power. And policy positions uh, in the Beijing Platform for Action or in the way that SDG 4 and 5 can be read together, all encapsulate some of this position. Um, the third position I call what disorganizes. And this position I have associated with the process of neoliberalism, where ideas about girls' education are taken and it's a form of gender washing. Girls' education is used to rinse out the unsavory politics or the unsavory economic relations. It's, it's, it's a kind of window dressing, a form of hypocrisy. Um, the, the most notorious example of this was um, uh, a, a big interview that um, Laura Bush gave at, on the eve of the um, American invasion of Afghanistan, saying that this war was justified because it would expand girls' education. So it's the way that girls' education is used in a bigger geopolitical um, process. And you still see large corporations on their um uh, on their front page, highlighting large corporations involved in terrible depredations of the environment or involved in very unsavory political engagements, um, presenting themselves as engaged with girls' education projects. The last position is the one which I, where I'm trying to, putting my heart and my mouth. It's uh, the position I'm formulated in terms of what connects. And it's where I want to see girls' education connecting with larger projects, larger projects of social transformation, but also the practice of that. 
not just uh, the ideas. It's girls' education is connected relationally with uh, normative ideas, with participatory processes. And the example I give of this is the ACHI project, which is uh, on the next slide, a project I lead, which has, uh, if we could go to, yeah, to the next slide, it's an, an attempt to use education st statistics um, and uh, measuring to think about connecting a wide girl's education with wider processes of social transformation in, in values, uh, in work, in, um, in an expansion of rights and feelings of safety and um, an ending of violence against women. So with these big ideas, if we go to the final slide, um, thanks for your attention. I, I've, what I've wanted to sketch out is different ways in which we can think about uh, gender equality in education, girls' education, as a political project that um, is, is not depoliticized. It's not the answer to everything, but it's part of the important questions we must ask and the relations we must build with each other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mariso. And thank you, Elaine, for that uh, really important presentation. Um, I'll situate my talk within Elaine's What Matters position. My talk is dedicated to the Black Lives Matter movement. The Hamedas increasingly rethink and reconstitute institutions and, and, and that produce racialized and intersectional hierarchies. <clears throat> Let me start with a story. I was invited to speak at an event in an elite location in the UK. In my panel, the participants were mainly visibly white, middle-class, cisgendered, and able-bodied female. Most were based in various Western international development organizations. They were there to discuss what more can they do to support the education of uh, marginalized black and brown girls in the global south? There was an obvious racialized hierarchy. Those who were the objects of interventions over there in the global south and those who held the power to make interventions from over here in the global north. A white speaker before me suggested the need to go beyond a deficit discourse towards darker skinned girls in the global south. It made me smile. My grandmother's generation was described in colonial documents as, British, as, as primitives and my mother's generation as semi-savage. So it is nice that I'm not being described that way. So given the composition of the audience, which was mainly white and their wonderful desire to go beyond a deficit discourse, I on the spot chose the title of my talk, which is in front of your screen. So what white people can do next? I was reading Emma Davery's book at the time. This talk is a call for solidarity. I have worked in the field of education and international development for over two decades as a practitioner in India, and more recently as an academic in the UK. I have come to realize that there exists a white savior industrial complex to save BIPOC women from BIPOC men, but there is an insufficient understanding of racism. I'm going to unpack it using the analytical concept of white feminism. As Elaine said, feminism is a very important concept, but there are many strands to it. So what is white feminism? <clears throat> Rafia Zakaria offers a definition. While you reflect on Zakaria's definition on the screen, um, let me add some disclaimers. This is not an attack on white colleagues. That's my first disclaimer. Um, white feminism is not attached to specific racialized bodies. You can be white and feminist, but not a white feminist. You can be brown 
look like me and yet be a passionate foot soldier of white feminism. White feminism is not attached to particular gendered bodies either. Also, the international development structure is a contested space, as we saw in Elaine's presentation. Individuals come from a diversity of politics and motivations, in my experience. So this is not an attack, but an invitation to discuss the role of racism in, in gender discourses. It is difficult to build solidarity without it. I define white feminism in education and international development as an ideological orientation that allies with white supremacist patriarchy. In this, feminism is co-opted to serve <clears throat> imperial, colonial, and war agendas. Inevitably, in white feminist stories, the object of demonization is again and again, again and again, brown and black masculinity and not white supremacist patriarchy. Now, allow me to explain how white feminism is co-opted to serve imperial, colonial, and war agendas. Let's look at these, these images. They were drawn by wealthy men, a British, a French, and a white settler in America. What do these images show? White feminism is a propaganda tool. They are shown as bringing civilization and enlightenment to barbaric, darker-skinned populations. They're shown as bringing modernity, education, freedom, rights, and progress to BIPOC peoples. Queen Victoria too was propped up by, as an empress of India, under the rhetoric of bringing emancipation to India's women. Gayatri Spivak famously calls this, white men were claiming to save brown women from brown men. But what do these images hide? Genocide, ecocide, mining extraction, forced sterilization, land confiscation, and mass displacement of racialized inferiors. It does not reveal the connection between white feminist privileges here and BIPOC girls' displacement there. Maria Lugones notes that colonization was a twofold process of racial inferiorization and gender subordination. According to her, gender itself is a colonial introduction, a, a violent introduction as a building ground of the civilized waste. The very existence of the white savior complex is due to disparities caused by white supremacist patriarchy. <clears throat> Let that map sink in for a moment. It is this disparity which enables white feminists to view themselves as superior people who are helping, leading, guiding marginalized girls in the global South. Let's look at some more data. White feminists express support for marginalized girls in the global South, but demonstrate little political commitment to the global redistribution of resources. Instead, they partake in a fake aid economy. That's what Zakaria Cole said that profits Western corporations and actors greatly. The past continues in the present. Let us take the example of women in Afghanistan that, um, <clears throat> that uh, Elaine was referring to earlier with Laura Bush's speech. On one hand, the USA-UK bombed the country for decades under the war on terror, destroying nearly every institution and social, social fabric. On the other hand, white feminists claimed that they were saving oppressive Afghan women from the Taliban. But what do critical feminist movements from Afghanistan tell us? Afghan women have a long history of feminist resistance against both brown and white patriarchy. <clears throat> Afghanistan has the world's highest number of mines per capita. Let me repeat, Afghanistan has the world's highest number of mines per, per capita. So women have had to fight against both British and Russian imperialism over resources for over 100 years. They have been resisting the Cold War battle between the US and the USSR that was played out on Afghan soil. They have been protesting against the CIA's role in the creation of terrorist groups on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. 
The US had funded jihadi literacy textbooks. It produced them at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. It was disguised as refugee education for displaced young Afghan men. Madrasas were funded to teach this curriculum and armed all of this so that they had an army of young Mujahideen who would become foot soldiers in the Cold War. The Hazara scholar Baiza from Afghanistan asked, where were saved the children, Christian aid, the British Council and the UK aid when displaced refugee children were being instrumentalized to become jihadis? Today, women in the global majority are the leading faces of protest against genocidal capitalist patriarchy. India, Iran, Hong Kong, Spain, USA, Palestine, Lebanon, Kenya, Uganda, Syria, Mexico, Colombia, and the list is much longer. They are unpacking how a small group of patriarchs of all skin colors profit from the global South's vast oil fields, mines, and resources and disaster capitalism, and how Western patriarchs also benefit through debt trap, misinvoicing, and structural adjustment. They tell you how this small group of patriarchs, supported by Western financial institutions, enable authoritarian regimes, fund ultra-conservatism, thwart democratic processes, weaponize identities, manipulate education, crush dissent, cause war, cause genocide, and kill freedom. They are theorizing from the place of margin, exclusion, and pain. They're widening our understanding of feminism that involves so much more than gender parity. It includes a consciousness of capitalism, racism, colonialism, imperialism, ability, sexuality, and the environment. They're creating some of the most inclusive visions of transformative justice for our time. They are building transnational coalitions they're asking for global political accountability, asking for reparations and a global distribution of resources, saying no to white saviors. But white feminists unsee this. They want us to see the altruism of Western donors and interventions. Mona El Thawi notes, white innocence is both a reward and a leash that ensures they work diligently on behalf of patriarchy upon which their livelihood depends. Thus the responsibility, sadly, to stand up to local brown and black patriarchy, supremacist patriarchy, as well as white supremacist patriarchy, falls on the very marginalized girls that they claim to care about. White feminism is powerful and insidious, and it causes more harm than good. Their civilizational tropes sanitize Western military interventions. Their neoliberal education creates cheap and precarious supply of a feminized biopark labor to serve a small group of transnational monopolistic corporate patriarchs. And their framing of interventions in the language of humanitarianism makes a critical assessment of these interventions difficult. We do not need colonial white feminism. What we need is a coalition. The genocidal capitalist patriarchy, which has been harming us in the global South, has, as Novelli writes beautifully in his article, has boomeranged and has come to harm in the global North too. I will end with a powerful message of Leela Watson. If you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because you, your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. That was definitely a very reflective presentation. And I know that uh, I enjoy your lectures a lot because it really allows us to position ourselves from different perspectives. Um, our last presentation now is uh, from Jenny Parks. So the microphone is yours, Jenny. Thank you, Marisol. Um, so our third presentation is uh, coming from a slightly different angle um, to the question of is girls' education the answer to everything? And the angle that um, I'm bringing is um, some reflections on um, what girls have um, been saying to us in research uh, on sexual violence in schools. Um, and this, in this, I'm drawing um, in particular on some ongoing research in Uganda 
um, working together with colleagues from various different organizations who you can see at the bottom of the screen um, and, and the individual names as well. Um, and the impetus to this presentation was the concerns that have been raised repeatedly in um, our research over the years by um, girls about sexual violence by teachers um, and school staff. Um, we, we know that schools aren't always schools say, always sites of safety, um, that a billion children each year um, experience physical, sexual or emotional violence. Um, and as far back in 2005, the UN World Report on Violence Against Children um, stated that studies suggest that sexual harassment of schoolgirls is common throughout the world to varying degrees by teachers themselves as well as by students. So the, this was important at that time in bringing into um, public awareness um, sexual violence in schools, including by teachers. But the evidence they drew on was, was really sparse. Um, and it relied on a very small cluster of mainly qualitative studies um, coming mainly from Africa. Um, and since then, though there has been a rapid growth on research on violence against children and violence against women, relatively few studies have looked at these um, issues of sexual violence by school staff. Um, and most of these have been small scale qualitative studies that have in various different locations painted a picture of commonplace teacher sexual violence um, with risks higher um, or elevated in contexts where there are high levels of poverty and gender inequality and also in conflict settings. <clears throat> um, but we're still missing a robust quantitative evidence on um, prevalence and patterning. Very few um, of the large scale surveys, surveys look at um, these, these issues. And um, where it is included, um, such as the demographic health service and uh, the back service violence against children surveys um although it's included amongst the list of questions it it tends in this country reports this all subsumed together in an overall sexual violence figures rather than pulling out um these as, as issues separately um there's also been a growing impetus in in terms of intervention and activism um, amongst international organizations and NGOs to intervene on violence against schools and its gender dimensions. But again, few of those have addressed teacher sexual violence. Um, and so, for example, the, the, um, on the right of the screen, I've put um, the two of the influential um, World Health Organization uh, frameworks, the INSPIRE, um, which is concern with violence against children and respect is concerned with violence against women. And those are really excellent frameworks at many, many levels, um, but neither of them have anything to say about sexual violence by school staff, nor in the research that um, they build on. So um, what I want to think about now is why is it, why are there silences um, surrounding teacher sexual violence, which I would argue um, impacts on the experience of education many girls and to answer this I'm, I'm going to draw on the insights from um, sorry wrong way um, from school girls themselves um, who've been participating in research in, in Uganda. Um, this is the context of violence in adolescent cohort study which we call COVAC which, COVAC, uh, which is a mixed methods um, longitudinal research uh, taking place in Luera district in central Uganda um, which aims to build understandings of how family, peer, school and community contexts affect young people's experiences of violence in adolescence and through to early adulthood. And as part of that research, there have been um, three rounds of surveys with young people um, in, uh, and in 2018, which I'm drawing on um, figures in this, in this, paper, in this presentation, uh, 2,773 um, young people were involved in that survey. Um, and then the quality of data collection has happened at least once a year um, over between 2018 and 2022 with 36 young people who um, uh, uh, broadly 15 to 17 years and, and with others as well, um, who've, involved, who've been engaged in um, a series of biographical narrative interviews, focus groups, community walks, and different kinds of unstructured um, discussions with their uh, key researchers who are um, Ugandan same-sex researchers and, and importantly have continued to work with them over time. 
Um, and the, the kind of analysis that we've um, we've tried to use is um, I call it a dialogical analysis, where we're um, bringing different lenses to interpret and act on um, the emerging findings. Um, including across kind of quantitative, qualitative, Uganda and UK, and research and practice, um, and recognising the limitations as well as the strengths of our varying positions in relation to um, research. Um, so I'm going to draw, think about uh, three layers of silencing. Um, and the first reason for silence is around teacher sexual violence relates to the, the shame. Um, stigma and uh, threats and harmful repercussions um, that young women face in speaking out about sexual violence that may be amplified um, when the abused is a teacher. Um, nonetheless, having built up researchers, sorry, relationships with the researchers over time, girls like Otim, who, who we have quoted here, narrated how um, teachers have approached them for sex and how, how um, and so she was asked about challenges in her secondary school and her response is the challenge I'm seeing comes from the teachers mostly, the male teachers. He can approach you seeking for an intimate relationship with you. And when you turn down his offer, he can start undermarking you with the aim of failing you. He does that so you can fall into his trap and he gives you good marks. And there were many other qualitative accounts from girls on um, male teachers trying to coax them or coerce them into sex through promises to pay schooling fees um, or to help with work or grades. Uh, sometimes they trapped girls in spaces where they were alone, it was difficult to escape, or they'd, um, or they'd threaten or award low grades and harsh punishments if girls refused. So there were many instances of male teachers abusing um, their institutional authority, drawing on gender and age discourses of female docility to coerce intersex and, and enforce silence. Um, our survey data found that about one in 20 girls, 4.9% of school girls had experienced sexual violence from teachers in the form of um, sexual comments or sexual touching, threats or pressure or money to, for, for sex or for sex itself. <clears throat> um, and we think this is likely to be an underreport, partly because of the, the shame and stigma that deter girls um, from speaking out in, in any research. Um, and partly also because it missed, um, we didn't ask about sex that was perceived as consensual. Um, second area of silencing um, that I want to draw attention to is at the institutional level. Um, so Uganda has quite comprehensive legal and policy frameworks to protect um, children from violence, including a teacher's code of conduct. But there seem to be um, disconnects with the school systems for support and address and redress that um, in the girls' accounts were quite variable and patchy. And I've just given three examples here. That one extreme was a kind of um, quite a rare positive example from Ruth, who said that a teacher's practice of caressing students stopped after girls um, reported. So she said that the girls uh, wrote notes and dropped them in the suggestion box. And this box is open so often. So when this issue was brought to the attention of the school admin, then it was handled. So there seemed to be a confidential reporting system that actually worked in that case. Um, at the other extreme was Linda, who said um, that there's nowhere to report because from the senior director of the school to the junior director and all the teachers who are male, all of them have romantic relations, relationships with students. Um, and then more commonplace for experiences like Nakifero, who, um, who reported uh, uh, sexual advances by a teacher towards her to the head teacher. Um, and there, there was some action taken. The teacher was given a warning but he kept his job and um, she told us how he continued to punish her after that. So the institutional responses frequently left girls unprotected. The school author authorities were um, often ignoring or colluding with sexual student-teacher relationships, although that wasn't always the case, there was some variation. Um, more often we found that girls found their own way to resist sexual advances often drawing on informal sources of support, like um, interventions from friends or passers-by, in one case, um, 
a, a cleaner intervened. In another case, it was a school security guard who intervened. So, but these were very incidental rather than institutional. Um, the third layer uh, that I want to talk about is the silences at the interface of research policy and practice. Um, I spoke at the beginning about silences in research um, globally and also about silences and interventions. But what I want to do here is to draw attention how I think these are connected. So interventions on violence tend to be still quite siloed between violence against children, which has focused a lot on um, child abuse, corporal punishment and bullying, and violence against women, which is focused more on sexual violence, and mainly in communities though, rather than school spaces. And it seems to me that teacher sexual violence falls through the cracks here. Um, for both strands, international organisations and donors have sought evidence-based programmes. They want to know, understandably, what works. But the evidence base that's drawn on privileges um, RCTs and quasi-experimental designs, what um, Mary describes as the seduction of quantification, often stripped of context and meaning. So it's not um, picking up necessarily what matters to girls. And it misses um, sexual violence and exploitation by teaching. And so, for example, the INSPIRE framework that I mentioned er er earlier, um, behind, behind that were 67 trials using the WHO Health Promoting School framework, and none of them focused on interventions on violence in low or middle income countries. Uh, nor had teacher sexual violence as a primary outcome. Um, and then of the in interventions that were evaluated um, using RCTs and quasi-experimental designs for the UK um, FCDO's flag flagship programme on what works to prevent violence against women and girls, which helped frame respect, two of them were based on um, school-based interventions as uh, violence dating violence and peer violence, but again, the report makes no mention of teacher sexual violence. Uh, there are some exceptions in the, um, on the right hand screen, you can see some of these, um, which come from work by the Global School Related Gender Based Violence Working Group, which is a, a network of activists, um, advocates, uh, practitioners and researchers working, who are trying to bring together connections between the violence against women and violence against girls strand, and to produce a number of resources that do touch on teacher sexual violence. Um, but they draw on quite limited um, research evidence, and there remains a, a clear need to combine robust uh, data on patterns and trends with more contextualized qualitative accounts that are grounded in local knowledge. So to conclude, too often we perceive silences as lack, girls' lack of voice, so the solution becomes education programs on um, violence that target children with school-based interventions aiming to strengthen their capacity to protect themselves or to teach them about gender equality or non-violent conflict resolution. But in this presentation, I've explored three layers of silencing concerning sexual violence by teachers through uh, dynamics of power and positionality in interpersonal relations in education institutions and at the level of research policy practice interface and all these layers I would argue need to be tackled eroding silences that have such deep impacts on girls education and lives requires multiple dialogues building reflexive and respectful connections between differently positioned research policy and practice um, and activist partners and engages young people and teachers as well to tackle sexual violence and exploitation in school spaces Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. So I think that definitely a common question or a common reflection that's been going around the three uh, presentations that Laila, Jenny and Elaine made were relating to connections and what kind of connections are needed. We're going to go on into the Q&A. Um, for all of you listening, um, remember that the questions are being made through Slido, slido.com, and the hashtag is Girls Education. So the first question we have for all of you is, what are the main messages that um, 
the three of you have for international organizations or donors concerned with girls' education? I don't know if um, who would like to start or if you would like for me to give you a set of three or two questions and then maybe you can take turns. Um, okay, give us them. two or three questions, Perfect. Marisol, and yeah. So that's the first one. The second one um, is related to addressing uh, continued marginalization or dismissal of gender minorities in the field of gender-focused global education. And then um, another question that they're asking is, why do you think the uneducated girl is such an appealing idea to utilize for neoliberal institutions? So I don't know if you want to start with those three questions. Okay, thanks, thanks uh, Marisol there. And thanks to the audience. There's, there's a lot to think with you about. Um, I think the uneducated girl is um, a powerful uh, figure because um, her lack of voice, her um, marginal position, her isolation, and her um, vulnerability she, she she is the figure of of disorganization. She doesn't build the alliances. She doesn't speak. She or maybe when she speaks, she will ventriloquize um, in 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 a received way. So, in in a way, you can see her almost as the um, uh, the perfect vehicle to. Um, uh, to talk for for other for other people to talk on her behalf, and I think it's that that is the very powerful uh, demand to international organisations is to end that powerlessness, to engage in uh, very real processes of participation and continued accountability to organizations of, uh, of, of, of young girls and young women that allow them to uh, speak about the conditions they engage in and to help to change them because the, to the extent that they're always being positioned as passive recipients of aid or largesse or various forms of feminism that they have not articulated themselves, they they remain in that passive position and the marginalization and the inequalities in the world are increased so the the, the kind of conceptual and political and practical dynamics around the position of what connects are, are trying to connect um theory with practice um uh, the powerful with the powerless um, and uh, not in this um, deceitful, hypocritical way that I think we've all given examples of in our different way, but in a very sustained way that is trying to transform the unjust relationships and use gender uh, girls' education in that process, not use it to maintain the unjust relationships and just girl wash it in some way. Um, let me pass to back to you, Marisol, and then Leila or Jenny might want to take it up. Definitely. Of course, these you know, dichotomies of knowledge and whose knowledge is powerful, you know, understanding who has the power of the discourse and how <laughs> some discourse become or who, whose voices are more important or tend to be more important than others. Um, so I don't know if Jenny or Leila have something to complement on, on what Elaine has just um, would you like to go first? Jenny? Oh, sorry. I thought you said, "Can I go first? Um, sure. I, I mean, I was just going to pick up on the question around um, the main messages for international organisations and donors. I mean, I think there's a kind of, in a sense, a simple message from uh, my presentation that isn't really, of course, simple at all. But it's it's to avoid caution against quick fix. 
um, responses, um, you know, things that are easily measurable, they're not necessarily going to, and um, probably not going to, um, to get to what matters to people, which was drawn out in all the presentations. And so to me, there's something about um, finding ways of working with these kind of complex layered social relations to underpin um, the issues. And that takes time. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of relationships that Elaine was talking about. So so I guess that's my um, number one message. Leila. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll respond to two questions. Uh, one where uh, uh, Ethan has asked, could the speakers please address the continued marginalization or dismissal of gender minorities in the field of gender focused education, global education? Elaine has partly answered it, but I'll add to that. Uh, and the second question was about what suggestion would you give to someone wanting to have an open conversation about white savior complex without causing offense? Let me start with this question. I, I think it's a very important question. In, in my experience, focusing on structural issue rather than in making it about individuals uh, is important. However, even when you raise something as individual issue, there is no guarantee that listener will not take it personal. So, so, so it's, it's not as easy as I'm trying to make it sound. Uh, secondly, white savior, what is it that white savior complex that makes it white savior complex? Because when it doesn't address the root causes of the issues on the first place, it hides it and then glorifies the charity, the aid that we are doing, we're saving you as we saw in the data. And then focus is also really, Jenny was very, presentation was very important where she talks about silences. And for me, what's the blatant silence here is the why is it focused constantly on aggressive sexuality and masculinity of only black and brown men and not on white supremacist men which which in current like historically and now in the last six years benefit the most and there is association with violence so those kind of silences i think need to be unpacked and maybe it's valid to say that that we do need to talk about what is racism and what issues are we not addressing in our constant reproduction of particular kind of knowledge um, having said that, I like that word, someone, in your question. What suggestion would you give to someone wanting to have an open conversation about white civil complex? Now, this someone with white privilege would be an enormous help to us because defense, layer of defenses, in my experience, can be slightly less when white colleagues speak to white colleagues about, about the issues. And they also get taken more seriously. I mean, so many times I know working with BAPAC feminist scholars whose experience resonates, you may say the same idea, but it may not be even get, get the hearing. People may just not even listen, but a white person says the same idea and suddenly it becomes, oh, what a fantastic idea. You see, so who gets taken seriously? So there is so much deep internalized racism wired uh, uh, into the structure and it has over 600 years of history of it so so what happens that someone is very important who is having the, having this open conversation um for someone who comes from biopark background like me there is double emotional labor involved a you first of all navigate your own emotions of facing racism and then you make someone aware that this constitutes racism and take care of their emotion as well so I think expectation from BIPOC people that they shouldn't cause offense would be in itself as oppressive. So I think that's why we would appreciate people with white privileges or dominant social groups in different contexts where different forms of hegemonies operate. It's important to start talking about various forms of racism in our international development work. So that's my response to you. I'm not sure if it addresses your concern, but that's how I would approach to start with. Now, you're absolutely right, Ethan, that there is continued marginalization, there is straightness to our pedagogies, our reports, our discourses, our knowledge production. It has been challenged very increasingly, and that's why I often say, although we may talk about social justice, but there may be so many ignorant spots we may have, 
and our own understanding of justice, what constitutes justice has been constantly being evolving and young generation has been absolutely brilliant at showing some of the mirror at us that, oh, look, you've been using this language, but this reproduces gender binary, this reproduces straightness or even ableism. And I don't think we've completely escaped that. So yeah, I just agree with you saying that uh, there is, other than saying, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering, but yes, I'm just reinforcing what you're saying. Over to you, Mariso. Thank you, Laila. I think that what you're mentioning about changing discourse using language and how younger generations are definitely becoming a lot more conscious and aware of the power of, of that language, particularly in relation to genders is, is just very powerful. No, I, 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 I have been learning and unlearning no, um, a lot about the power that the words that we use to yeah. address certain people. Um, and, and I think that's sort of, a starting point to change and transform the things that are being done, how, how, how you all three have mentioned it in your presentations. Um, now the creation of coalitions is needed. Um, there's, there's definitely um, a lot to discuss and we still have a couple more minutes here. So I don't know, Jenny, if you would like to, to comment on the questions um, that uh, Leila and Elaine were, were answering, and then we will move on to another question that we have on, on Slido. Um, well, just to follow on from what Leila was saying, um, I, I, you know, we, we you know, completely agree with um, this kind of question about um, causing offence. That kind of can be at all sorts of different levels. Um, and defensiveness isn't always. Um, particularly constructive in terms of changing things because people tend to kind of um, become very resistant. But all, but being discomforted is um, very productive. Um, you know, for me, I feel um, often very discomforted in, um, in the work that I do. And that can be, it can make me think. Um, and I think thinking, so, so I think um, encouraging reflexivity um, and recognizing our own positionality within you know racist and um, sexist and um, other kind of forms of discourse um, and recognizing those kind of power hierarchies within ourselves but also within the relationships that we have in our research or in our practice or our activism is um, really productive and we shouldn't be shying away from that that kind of discomfort because that discomfort is part of the process of change. So I, I, I guess I'm um, agreeing with what you're saying and talking about that at a kind of personal level, but also trying to take that into thinking about well, what about this notion of connections and how and and change and how we build those. That, uh, um, so just followed on really from from what you were saying, Leila. Yeah, definitely, you know, transforming or being in, in the uncomfortable. So I think this is very important, you know, putting ourselves in the uncomfortable situations of understanding our positionality and and all sort of the social construct that has created us and our perspectives. Um, we have two questions um, on the slide, Slido, and I think these are mostly addressed to you, Jenny. So the first one um, is, how have teachers' organizations engaged with evidence and sexual violence committed by teachers or not? Is there a fear of teachers being demonized? And the other question is um, basically asking uh, is that there's an understanding that only male teachers are abusing girls or, you know, is a research uh, showing us something else? Um, okay, very interesting question. Um, in, in terms of the last question around, uh, in for our, our study, there was it, it, it was mainly male teachers and girls. We have talked to boys as well, um, but it's much much lower um, amongst boys. And in the qualitative research, it wasn't brought up at all. In the in the qualitative research, it wasn't brought up. Um, so, of course, um, sexual boys do experience sexual violence and the same kind of silences um, are, are there. So I'm not saying that's not happening, but that's that's why I focus particularly um, on girls in our study. Um, <clears throat> in relation to teachers' organisations, that's a really, really good question. Um, and the our partner organisations we're 
we work with work very closely with teachers and with teacher organizations um I, i'm kind of quite aware of in my presentation the possibility of demonizing teachers and i did want to say that you know that the practices varied between schools and i was trying to give examples of those to partly not do that whilst also being really angry about um what you know, in, and sort of distressed at, at what was um, what we were hearing. Um, in terms of teacher organisations, I think there's a lot of scope for working with teacher unions, and, and I know Ungai has done some really interesting work with teacher teacher unions as well. Um, and uh, teacher unions um, are concerned with the kind of uh, professional practice of teachers. So I know people have there's been concerns about whether um, pe people become defensive or organisations become defensive of um, their members. Um, but I, I think the work that Ungai have been doing has been um, trying to work with very committed um, teacher unions in different contexts on issues around gender equality, including um, violence, um, working against violence. And of course, you know, teachers are committed to that too. But it's certainly for me, it's um, a big area that we're working with at the moment is how do you how do how do our partner organizations in in this work um in a sense it's only just beginning what do you what do you do when you start to get these findings in terms of how you engage with teachers with the organizations teachers work with with um district level officials with governments um as well as the international community on on these issues excellent thank you jenny um we're running out of time so, I mean, again, I think you're posing this question to address you know, violence and teachers, again, by creating um, uh, links or linking um, organizations and local organizations and teachers unions. Um, so I think we will have one last question, if, if that's all right with, with you. Um, so I think just as an as a ending note to this uh, lecture, what kinds of research do you think are needed? And what is uh, the role of, of an organization like the IOE, for example, and UCL um, in addressing um, the, the topics that you, you have talked about in your presentations? Sh shall I go first? Yes, definitely. Maybe myself. if you want okay. to go. Okay. I mean, I, I I feel we need a very wide ranging scope of research. We need research methods that talk to each other. And Jenny spoke about dialogue, but we need to get away from the uh, idea that there's only one um, uh, authentic way to uh, understand um, how girls' education can make a difference. We need to accept the complexity and contextualization and the, his, the history of, of, of the processes and the very wide range of differently positioned actors involved. Uh, I think we also need to think about research that is oriented to a kind of social justice or social transformation or... Uh, uh, a, a kind of process of change that takes seriously all the inequalities and histories Leila was uh, outlining and the again the complexities in Jenny's position um, so actually it's not simple research it's research that requires a wide range of disciplines uh, and a wide range of methods and you know, the IOE is lucky for being uh, uh, located in a big university, surrounded by many universities, and with a, a kind of critical, uh, a, a kind of orientation to critical and reflective scholarship. And I think we need to draw on all of that. Um, so those are the kinds of connections that I've I would I, I'm I'm promoting, you know, if something matters to you, you need to make it work. And IOE is very good at thinking about practice. And that that's also something I would stress. Shall I pass? Yes, pass definitely. Back to, you, Maris, so. and back to me. And yeah, I, I definitely feel that I've been questioning a lot of my points of view, you no, know, since I've come here. Um, so yeah, reflective um academia, you no. Know, 
Um, I don't know if Leila or Jenny would like to compliment a lot more, uh, a little bit on on what Elaine we have. We're, we're very quick last like, remark. <laughs> like very quick remark, and I know it's already two o'clock, but I, I would say it's important to use various interdisciplinary lens, as Elaine is saying, absolutely. And to add to that, anti-racism shouldn't be optional. It should actually be foregrounded and made it very important. And the reason is, if you look at decolonizing research methods, Linda Tuiwai-Smith and others work. I mean, we know that research itself evolved but from the needs of the empire to serve the needs of the empire. So a lot of tools can remain grounded in the same need to serve the empire and imperial control over in the world around. So we need to examine the tools critically. What's happening is people may then be using social justice ideas, but tools may still remain grounded in into particular colonial framework. And then it creates a little bit of incoherence, which an outsider coming into it might notice more clearly, but may not have power to, to speak to, right? And th this, this is where even if you follow more affirmatively anti-racist and decolonial methodologies as important, ethical commitment, then also, are we making career, our own bourgeois career using marginalized people suffering? Or are we actually ally with them? Are we engaged politically in that struggle for justice? Or are we just researching them becoming authors and experts in their story, moving on with another grant to another marginalized people? This is, this is, this is, this is internalized racism. And, 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 and so, is there, a, is there a genuine political commitment to stay, to really improve the lives of girls and we are with them or speaking over them? I think these are some important questions we need to consider. Definitely, so wrapping up, um, thinking of all the things that Leila just, just uh, told us, we need to wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Jenny, Elaine, and Leila for your very valuable insights into this conversation of is girls education enough? Thank you everyone for watching. Have a lovely day.